this morning. John 16, verse 4, B. John 16, verse 4, B. The disciples had been called by Jesus to follow him. Uh, They had walked with him. They had seen his miracles like changing water to wine and walking upon the water and calming the storm, even raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. They had heard his teaching the teaching that comes from the Father from heaven. And yet, according to Jesus himself, it was to their advantage that he would go away. Why? How could it be to their advantage, and for that matter, our advantage today as his disciples, that he would go away to the Father? How would it benefit them and benefit us if he were to go away and go to the Father? Well, our text this morning in John chapter 16, verses 4b to 15, will answer that very question as to why it was for their advantage and to ours that Jesus went away to the Father. So let's look there at God's Word, starting in 4b. Jesus says to them, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things That are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we pray that you would help us, uh, that you would give us understanding, that you would also give us application. Lord, help us to move to a response to your word this morning. We're trusting that the same spirit that inspired John to write these words would also give us understanding, wisdom, and application for our lives today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The evening before Christ's death, which is where we find ourselves, on that evening... Not only did the disciples learn that one of them would betray Jesus, uh, that Peter would deny Jesus, and that he was leaving and departing from them, but they also learned, as we saw last week, that they would face hatred from the world, uh, that they would be persecuted on account of Christ and his name. And so Jesus said to them here in our text Continuing that conversation, I did not say these things to you from the beginning. That is, I did not tell you about the hatred that would come to you from the world. I did not tell you that you would be persecuted on account of my name because I was with you. Up until this point, the the disciples did not need to know about the hatred that they would encounter. They didn't need to know about the coming persecution because Jesus was there physically with them. Yet all of that was about to change. Uh, Jesus was not going to be with his disciples much longer, at least not in the physical sense of being with them. Now think back with me to John chapter 14. There we saw when Jesus explained all of this, that there was going to be betrayal and denial and departing from them and where I'm going, you cannot come. What happened to their hearts in that moment? John 14, verse 1 says what? Do not let your hearts be 
troubled, right? They were greatly disturbed by the words that Jesus was telling them. And yet he says to them, he didn't, they, don't, they didn't need to be troubled. They needed to trust in him just as they trusted in the Father. And he gave them assurance. He said to them, I'm going to the Father's house. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And where I am, I will come and take you to be, right? You're going to be with me someday. He gave them comfort and assurance in that moment back in John 14. Well, evidently, the disciples still hadn't yet understood what all of this meant for themselves. He's going away. We can't go yet to where he's going, to the Father. All this is going to happen to him, and they yet still didn't understand what that would look like, right? The crucifixion and all that. They didn't know yet what that would all look like. And yet Jesus says to them in verse 5, But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, which this should ring a bell, though. None of you ask me, he says, where are you going? Now, didn't they already say that? Didn't they already ask that type of question of him? Yes, they did. Uh, Peter and Thomas both asked similar questions of Jesus back in John 13, 16 and John 14, 5. So what does Jesus mean by, by, them, by him saying to them, but now I'm going to him who sent me, but none of you asks me where I'm going, if they already did kind of ask him a similar question? Well, there's many, uh, there's many uh, different views of this. Uh, perhaps it means that they're not asking presently, right? That asks now in the present. You're still not asking me. Um, others also believe, and I, I tend to think that perhaps here he's pointing out that they're still not asking when they do with the right perspective in mind. They're still not totally understanding the reality of what this means for both Jesus and themselves. Because we know that because of what happens in the next verse. Look what he says to them. But because I've said these things to you, you're going to experience hatred. They're going to hate you on account of my name. They're going to throw you out of the synagogue. What happened? What did they, how did they respond to those words? He says to them, sorrow has filled your heart. Their hearts were filled with sorrow. Their hearts were filled with pain because of the words that Jesus was saying to them. So clearly, they did not yet understand the significance and the consequence of, G of Jesus leaving and what that would mean for them. Even though he had already talked about the helper coming and being with them and in them. And so we see back in 14, he said that trouble had filled their hearts. Now, sorrow had filled their hearts. But let's, let's just kind of take a human perspective at this, right? A, a little look from our own shoes, so to speak. Can you not relate to the disciples as to why they would be troubled and sorrowful in their hearts because of hearing that Jesus was going away and they couldn't come with him? I think from a human perspective, we can understand why pain gripped their hearts, why sorrow had filled their hearts. Just think about it. When someone is near and dear to us, and we know that they're about ready to pass away, or they do pass away, while we can acknowledge that it is better for them that they do that. Right? It's better for them. They've been struggling for a long period of time or they're just getting advanced in age and they're struggling with life. It would be better for them right, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord in that, in that moment. And many of us have felt that in the passing of a loved one. But does that take away or negate the experience that we have who remain where sorrow and pain are still a part of life? No. Right? It doesn't. Even though we know it's better for them, it was going to be better for Jesus. He's going back to the glory. He's going back to the glory that he once shared with the Father. Absolutely, it would be better for him to be with the Father. But still, I think we can relate to the disciples here that pain and sorrow still became a part of their lives because separation does tend to bring with it that. But yet, as difficult as it might have been for the disciples to grasp in that moment, 
They did not need to be filled with sorrow. They did not need to have pain-filled hearts. They needed, in fact, to have a joy-filled heart. They should have been rejoicing in those moments at the words that Jesus was saying to them. Why? Because Jesus going back or going away from them would ultimately be for their benefit, for their good. As he says to them in verse 7, so nevertheless, right, in spite of your sorrow, what you're feeling right now, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So as difficult as it was for them, it was for their advantage. It was for their benefit. It would be profitable for them that Jesus go away. Now, they're not telling him to go away, right? He's, he's intentionally on his own going away from them. Don't miss what he's saying to them. Don't miss the truth. He says to them, I tell you the truth. That doesn't mean he was lying the other times. He wants them to really get it, right? I tell you the truth. Listen to what I'm saying to you. It is to your advantage that I go away. Don't be sorrow-filled, disciples. Rejoice, for the helper will not come if I do not go away. Now, it's not that the Holy Spirit could not come and work at the same time that Christ was on earth. We know that's not the case. Right? And we know that the Holy Spirit has been at work throughout history. He was there in creation. He was there working in the lives of the people throughout the Old Testament. But Jesus leaving and going to the Father would be for their advantage. Because the helper, the Holy Spirit, would come. He said in John 14, 6, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. He had helped them, right? He had comforted them. He was their advocate. But now there would be another helper, one who would continue the work of Christ and that he may be with you forever. So it's not just for a period of time, but forever. And he says, that is the spirit of truth. The world cannot receive, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him. He says to the disciples, because he abides with you and will be in you. And so now, this helper, the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is going to come and not just be with you, but he's going to abide. He's going to remain in you. That's, that's a difference. And he's going to be with you forever. And so in Jesus going away, the Spirit would come. He, both the Father and the Son, we see in Scripture, would send the Spirit. And in that sending of the Spirit, they would have an advantage now that they didn't have before. And not just for them, but every believer. If you're a Christian here today, it was for your benefit that Jesus go away to the Father. And again, throughout the Old Testament, we see he was there in the uh, creation account in Genesis. We see that the Spirit was hovering over the waters. We see that the Spirit moved upon the kings and the prophets and the people of the Old Testament. We see that even when Jesus came, don't you remember back at Christmas we saw that Mary was told that the Holy Spirit would what? Overshadow her, right? The power of the Most High. He would come upon her and that she would conceive Christ in her womb. So the Holy Spirit's been at work. It's not that this is a, a first-time arrival of the Spirit that he's talking about here. But... Even though we see that throughout the Old Testament the Spirit has been at work, the third person of the Trinity, we also see in the Old Testament that there is a promise that in the last days the Spirit would be poured out upon the people of God and that his work would be a much greater work. Go with me to Joel chapter 2. That's that odd uh, prophet there in the Old Testament. You might flip past. Go to Joel chapter 2, verse 28. So I'll give you a moment. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. Here, listen to what God says through the prophet Joel about his spirit and what he would do in the last days. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. And this is just one of the promises. There's many others in Ezekiel and Isaiah and so forth. But we're just going to look at one. 
Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29, it says, the Lord through, uh, Joel says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants, in those days, I will pour out my spirit. You see the promise? There's going to be, again, the spirit was already there, working. He was there, moving among the people and in the people. But now there's a promise of a much greater pouring out, isn't there? On all flesh, on God's people. Now, think about what Joel said here in Joel 2, or what God said through Joel, more rightly said. And now think about what Jesus is saying to them in John chapter 16. What do you think Jesus was preparing his disciples for? He was preparing his disciples for the fulfillment of this promise. How do we know that? Well, go with me to Acts chapter 2, and we will find out why that is the case. Because we know that the Spirit was sent. After John 16, after what we're looking at here today, the Spirit was sent, just as Jesus said. The Helper did come on the day of Pentecost, which was 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven. As the disciples and the others were gathered in the room together, what happened? The Spirit came. It was a phenomenal experience, right? Rushing wind, flames of uh, tongues of fire above their head appeared, right? Just a supernatural occurrence. And what did they do? They spoke in other tongues or other languages. And there were people there in Jerusalem that happened to speak those languages, and they heard the mighty works of God proclaimed in their own language. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I think Acts 2 is a or Acts 1, Acts 2, phenomenal thing. The birthday of the church, right? The Spirit was given. But look what happens. Because as people watched and observed this taking place, as they watched and observed in that, we know it's in the morning, because what Peter says here, but that morning when that happened, people kind of looked at the disciples and those who were filled with the Spirit as, well, this is, this, something's not right. right. They're drunk. right? They're filled with new wine. So look what Peter says in Acts 2, verse 14. He says, standing with the eleven, he lifted up his voice and addressed them, that is the crowd, and he says, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Do you think this is important about what he's going to say? Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. What does he say? These people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, that is nine in the morning. But this is what was uttered through who? The prophet Joel. Peter, inspired by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, was able to see that the promised coming of the Spirit being poured out in the new covenant age had come to pass. He says in verses 17 to 18, Almost exactly what we read, isn't it? And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now we know that the last days started back with Christ's work on the cross and in his resurrection. Since that time, we've been in the last days. So do you see what Jesus was preparing them for? This promised fulfillment of the Spirit of God being poured out on all flesh. Jesus was preparing them in John 16 for what would take place 10 days after he returned to the Father. Isn't it amazing to think that when he arrived there at the right hand of the Father, what is one of the things that he said to the Father? Father, I told them that we would send the Spirit. Now, I'm, I'm saying it in my own words, right? Don't say that this is what Jesus said. We don't know how it went down, 
But we do know that he kept his promise, didn't he? Acts is proof of that. The day of Pentecost is proof of Jesus keeping his word and of the Father sending and of Jesus sending the Spirit. So it truly would be for their advantage and for ours as well. The helper, the Spirit, would come to be with us and in us, empowering us to live this new life in Christ and also empowering us to be effective in the work of making Jesus known in the world. It's exactly why the Spirit was coming, right? Even in the face of hatred and persecution, we would have a helper, they would have a helper to empower them to be effective in making disciples. So number one, we see the point here that Jesus' return to the Father and the sending of the Spirit is for the benefit of his people. It's for the benefit of his people, the sending of the Spirit. Not just for them, but also for us. Now the first work that we're going to see that the Holy Spirit would do and is doing now, we find in in verse 8. Jesus says to them, and when he comes, so when the helper, when the Spirit comes, he will do what? He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, I was at a workshop two weeks ago. They talked about passages that are hard to come to an understanding of. And what do you do with them? This is one of them. There are many, many, many views on this passage. And that's because in the original language, it's so narrow, I mean, so rigid in the way it's written that it's hard to understand the meaning of these words and what Jesus is really getting at. But I do believe, and many that I trust in as far as commentators go and scholars go, I do believe that we can glean from this what Jesus is saying, even if we're just scratching the surface, okay? So bear with me. Let's look. First, what do we see the world, the Spirit will do in the world? He will what? Convict the world. Now, who is the world? John often refers to the world in a particular way. He refers to the world as the whole ungodly multitude that is alienated from God and opposed to Jesus. Let's just summarize it. He's referring to who? Unbelievers. Those who reject Christ and who are opposed to God. And so that is the world that he's referring to. The Spirit will do the work of convicting. So what does convicting mean? Well, convicting can mean kind of a judicial or legal sense, right, of bringing a verdict, judge, right, you know what that's all about back there, sorry, I don't want to point you out, Judge Washington's back there, okay, so, but that's not what we're talking about here, we're not talking about bringing a verdict in the judicial sense, it's more likely, because convicting can also mean this, and this is what it's more likely meaning, conviction can also mean an exposing and a bringing a sense of shame That is a convincing. That is, it leads to something. So the the Spirit would come and convict. He would bring a sense of shame for sin and evil doing, but it would be a shame and a convincing of that that would lead people to Jesus. It's a convincing, it's a convicting, it's an exposing, not just to bring a sentence down on them, declare them guilty, but that would lead people to know and understand that they have a great need for the Savior. So let's look at what he means by this. So number two, before we do that, sorry, number two, the Holy Spirit convicts the world. So let's look at the ways that Jesus says the Spirit will convict the world. First of all, verse nine, concerning sin. So the Spirit would convict the world and convicts the world concerning sin. Because, Jesus says, they do not believe in me. And so the Spirit will convict the world of their sin, and primarily he will do that through the witness of Christ's own people. Back in John 15, 27, he said that the Helper would bear witness about him, and he said to them, you will bear witness of me. And so how does the Spirit bring this conviction, this exposing and this convincing to people that they need the Savior as primarily as Jesus' people declare his truth and witness to him? The Spirit uses the word that Christ's people declares to people. And so as Christ's people go around sharing Jesus' 
truth, the gospel, the Spirit will work in people's lives, convicting them and convincing them of their own sin, of their own rejection of Christ, and of their need to repent and turn from sin and turn to Jesus in faith. Are you with me? The Spirit will convict people of their sin primarily because of what? Because they do not believe in Jesus, he says. You see, all sin is condemned by God, right? All sin leads to death. All sin deserves punishment and judgment. But it is the sin of unbelief that ultimately will condemn us to hell. Jesus said in John 3, 36, whoever does not believe is what? Condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So it is people's unbelief, which, by the way, leads to their other sin. If you don't believe in God, you don't believe in his truth, you reject his Son, you're going to go your own way and sin, right? And live in the pattern of the world. So it is that, it's their unbelief that ultimately leads people to their condemnation. And the Spirit comes and graciously works to convince people of their sin, of their rejection, of their unbelief, and of their need for the Savior. And so let's just practically think about this. I do not have the job of convicting people of their sin. You, as believers, when you share God's truth, when you share the hope of Jesus with people, you don't have the job of convincing and convicting and exposing people of their sin. You don't. The Spirit does. You are simply, I am simply to declare Christ and his word. If people accuse me or others of convicting them, it's not me that's doing that. As I'm sharing the word... The Spirit of God is at work convicting and convincing people of where they have sinned and of their need for Jesus. Does that make sense? The job of conviction is off of us. The Holy Spirit is the convictor, is the convincer, is the exposer. He brings us to that place of shame and of understanding that we have sinned, that we have rejected Jesus, and we need to repent and believe. And he does that as the word of Christ is proclaimed, as Jesus' disciples bear witness to Jesus. Next, Jesus says that the Spirit convicts the word, verse 10, concerning what? Righteousness. And he says, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. So when Jesus walked the earth, we know that he is the righteous one, right? He is the light of the world. And when he, the light of the world, came, what did he do? His light exposed the darkness of men's hearts, didn't it? Oh, yes, it did, right? Think back to some of the confrontations that he had in John's gospel with the religious leaders, right? He exposed the evil intentions of the heart. People hated him not because, ah, he's a nasty man, right? They hated him because they loved what? Evil. And Jesus' light, his righteousness, exposed that lack of righteousness in them. He is the perfect righteousness. And so since Christ, the righteous one, is gone away to the Father, who continues to do that work? Who continues to reveal one's own lack of righteousness? Who continues to point people to the righteousness of Christ and that he alone can be the one that atones for our sin and that we need his righteousness. Who does that work? The Spirit, right? The Spirit continues to show the world because Christ is gone, but he continues to show the world. He continues to convict the world that even its best works, even its best attempts are like filthy rags. Let's continue. Jesus then says what? That the Spirit will convict not just of sin but of, and righteousness, but... Next slide. Verse 11. I'm sorry. Concerning judgment. There we go. Concerning judgment. Why? Because the ruler of this world is judged. 
Now, I want you to think back with me what we've learned so far in John's gospel and with Jesus' teaching. Unbelievers belong to a family, right? We belonged to a family before we became a child of God. We belong to the family of who? The devil, right? Our father is the devil. If we're not a Christian, if we're not born again, we are sons and daughters of the devil. That's what Jesus says, not what Caleb says, right? You're either a child of the devil or a child of God. And you don't, you're not born a child of God. You're born again to be a child of God. It's a supernatural, spiritual thing that takes place by the grace of God. And so unbelievers are just mimicking their spiritual father. We're called to mimic Jesus, right? We're called to mimic as believers our father. But before we became a believer, and anyone who's not a believer, they just mimic their spiritual father. They do as he does. And what does he do? He is a liar. He is a twister of the truth. He is an accuser. Right? And he judges falsely about all things. Think about it. Does the world make proper judgment about God? Did you make a proper judgment about God in Christ before you became a believer? No. Now it makes sense as to why the world is the way it is, right? They don't make proper judgments because they're just following their father in his footsteps. Because of their own spiritual blindness to the truth, the world judges falsely. And the devil, the ruler of this world, Jesus says, is judged. Look at what Paul says to the church in Colossae, the, the Colossian church in Colossians 2, 13 to 15. He says, and you, speaking to believers, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. But look what he also says he did. What did Jesus do? He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them into open shame. Who was he shaming? The devil, right? He's talking about spiritual rulers and authorities. He disarmed them and put them to open shame on the cross by triumphing over them in him. Now, Jesus hadn't yet gone to the cross, but he already said to them, he is judged, right? Remember, um, a couple chapters ago, I think we said, he ain't got nothing on me. You remember that? Oh, man, I wish it was going to stick with you. That's why I did that, right? Look back at the end, I think, of chapter 13 or 14. Jesus says, he has nothing on me, right? The ruler of this world has nothing on Christ. He's no match for Jesus. On the cross, he disarmed him, and he triumphed over him. His butt's already been whooped, right? He knows his day is limited. His days are limited. He is like a dog on a chain. Therefore, therefore, Jesus says, he, he, the Spirit will convict the world concerning judgment. What's he saying? Well, because the ruler of this world is judged, the world is on notice. The ruler of the world is already judged. And if you belong to that ungodly multitude, opposed to God and Christ, what will also come to you as well? Judgment. It's a warning. But the Spirit would come and do this work, this work of convincing, of convicting, of exposing, and leading people to Jesus and their need for his atoning sacrifice on the cross. And the Spirit does this as Christ's people make him known, as they declare his word, as they share the gospel. Verse 12, he says, I still have many things to you, but you cannot bear them now. Can you just imagine them? They're wrestling with all this information Jesus knows, you can't bear anymore, right? I can't tell you the rest of what I want to tell you because you couldn't receive it. 
They couldn't yet in their, in their minds understand all that Jesus wanted to share with them. And so number three, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So what's, what do we see here? What he says to them next. Number three, the Holy Spirit led the disciples to understand the truth of God. Jesus couldn't give them all that he wanted to tell them, and so he tells them the Spirit will do that when he comes. Verse 13, when the truth, Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. You can't bear it now, but the Spirit, he will guide you. He will be your teacher. He will tell you the truth of God and about me specifically and about how you are to live as my people, this new covenant community. And so what, what will he do? It says in verses 14 and 15, he will also glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, this point I put in the past tense. Did you notice that? The Holy Spirit led the disciples to understand the truth of God. And I did that on purpose because what Jesus is saying here, that the, that the Spirit would come and lead them into truth and declare the things of heaven to them and give them understanding of what is to come, I said that in the past tense because largely that's been fulfilled or pretty much has been. The Spirit is not doing that in this way anymore. He does, again, convince us of the truth. He does lead us in the understanding of the truth of God's word, but he's no longer bringing us new information from heaven for us, if that makes sense. And so the Spirit led the disciples to understand the truth. And he would not come and speak of himself, would he? He would come and speak of who? Christ. Jesus says he will come and glorify him. He will come and glorify Jesus. But notice Jesus says that he will share with them, declare to them the things of the Father, which are the things of Christ. And this is another reference to Christ's equality with the Father and his divinity. We've seen this time and time again. If Jesus can say, all that the Father has is mine, it's my possession, no mere man can say that. No mere man can go around and say, all that the Father has, that's mine. No, it's not, unless he gives it to you, right? Jesus can say, all that the Father has is mine because he's equal to the Father. He is God in the flesh. And so again, another reference to his divinity. But the Spirit did come, and he did guide the disciples into the truth. How do we know that? The fact that you and I are picking up the Gospel of John today is testimony of that reality. How could John write what he wrote? Because the Spirit of God came, and he filled John, and he was with John, and he led John to recall the things that Jesus said to him. As he said earlier, the Spirit will help you to remember all that I've said to you. The Spirit of God is why we can trust the New Testament today. It's why when we pick up Paul's letters to Timothy, we can know that this isn't just a man's letter to his son in the faith, but this is a man who was filled and inspired by the Spirit and wrote the truth that Jesus is speaking of here. When we read Romans, we can know this isn't just Paul's made-up stuff, but it is Paul filled with the Spirit, inspired by the Spirit, being led to know the things that are to come and how we are to live as Jesus' people here on earth. Are you with me? It gives us assurance that the New Testament, what you and I call the New Testament today, which wasn't yet written when Jesus said these things, it gives us assurance that it is his word because he did come. Acts tells us that. Jesus kept his promise. The Spirit did come. They spoke in other languages. They were his witness in Judea, in Jerusalem, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. They began to go and make disciples of all nations like Jesus said. And as they did, the Spirit of God helped them to write Christ's truth, which is the Father's truth. Wow, I don't know about you, 
But this should encourage us. But what else would he do? He would glorify Christ. Number four, the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ. I want you to just think about that. Dwell on that thought for a moment that he will glorify me. The Spirit did not come to bring about a new kingdom, a different kingdom that Christ, than Christ was inaugurating. He wasn't coming to make now things about himself. He was coming to glorify Christ. That word glorify there means to bring people to a knowledge of one's worth and value. The Spirit of God has come and he brings us to an understanding of the worth, of the magnitude, of the majesty, of the wonder that Christ is. He seeks to make him known, to make him famous, if you will, in the world. And that's important because, I don't know about you, but I've had experiences where there's different circles that I've been a part of growing up that they are really, really about the Holy Spirit. And it's good that in the last hundred years, there's been a renewed interest in the work of the Spirit. We don't want to become dried up religious people, devoid of the Spirit and His power. We don't want to become that. But some people have stressed the Holy Spirit to the point of emphasizing Him and setting Jesus to the side. The Holy Spirit will not make much of himself. He will not come and make much of the gifts that he gives to people. He will not come and turn people's attention to him, to seek and run after him. He has come to make Jesus known and to cause people to run to him. Amen? Amen. So here we go. What does this mean? Christian, I want you to be encouraged. The disciples needed to be encouraged. You need to be encouraged because if you look out there in the world today at the state of the church, there's a lot of trouble, isn't there? It's particularly in the Western world. The church is exploding in other areas where there's persecution. Uh, there's underground churches. There are people that are meeting in secret in China. There are people that are coming to the United States from other places that we used to send missionaries to. So sure, there's a lot of things that might cause you to be a little discouraged with the state of the church today, capital C Church. But I want you to be encouraged that Christ knew what he was doing and he knows what he is doing. He has gone away. He has secured for us in that going away salvation through his death and resurrection. How did he get to the Father? He had to go through the cross. But he also, in his going away, sent us the Helper, he sent us the Spirit who is with us and in us, and he continues to be at work in the world today, glorifying Christ and convince, convicting people of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Father God, we thank you today for the promises that you've kept. Once again, in this text, we see that. The promises that you made to your people long ago, you have kept them. Jesus himself is trustworthy. He's kept his promise to his disciples and to us as a result. We thank you for this good gift of your spirit. We thank you that the spirit has come, that he is at work in the world today. Thank you that we, if we're a believer here today, we've experienced that convicting work already. If we've come to name the name of Jesus, we know that he's already been at work in our lives. Father, thank you that the Spirit came and led these disciples into the truth. Thank you that he gave an understanding of the things to come of the way that you've called us to live as your people, as Christ's bride. Would you, Father, help us fill us fresh and anew this day? Help us to be yielded in an even greater way to the Spirit in our lives, that his fruit would be even more evident. 
that his sanctification work would be even greater. And God, that your, that your power through the Spirit would be manifested in such a way here, in this body, that there would be no doubt that you're at work. Father, thank you for the gift and the promise of your Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.